Koto, uh, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar tonight. Um, we have Finn Ross here from Lake Harbour Station in, in Otago, and he will tell you a little bit about himself. So I think it'd be really good just to get underway now. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen you should be able to see. And there'll be uh, roughly 40, 45 people coming in over time. Okay, Finn, take it away. Cool. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, kia ora, everyone. I'll just I'll share my share my screen. You got that there? Yep. Yeah, cool. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk tonight. Looking forward to um, having a bit of a discussion on climate change and farming. I'll, I'll talk uh, just for 15 or so minutes around our journey on Lake Hawea Station and how we've got to um, the, where, where we are as the first carbon neutral farm and first carbon positive certified farm uh, in, in New Zealand. So I'm a, uh, my day to day is I'm a PhD candidate. I'm studying out of uh, Deakin University in Australia researching seaweed as a nature-based solution to climate change. But obviously with, with COVID um, in Melbourne this year, I've spent most of my time at the farm, which is uh, you know, feeling really grateful to be based here in Central Otago on the station and um, you know, being able to get hands-on on the farm. I'm you know, really passionate about farming and agriculture in New Zealand. Uh, so yeah, pretty, pretty grateful to be, to be based here while I'm uh, working on my research and then separately involved on a, a few other small startups and um, Climate, climate action groups, uh, but yeah, the two two big things are for me are the farm and, uh, and and my PhD, which I can briefly touch on um, at, at the end. But for now, uh, climate change and agriculture on on, on Lake Kawea Station. So a, a bit a bit of background. Um, we're, we're actually my mum and dad are both from a farming background. Both grew up on farms. Uh, myself, I actually grew up in grew up in Auckland. Me and my brother are really keen uh, adventurers, spent a lot of time fishing and diving and in the mountains. Uh, so it was pretty, I guess, a lot of people ask us, was it a big sort of change coming down to the farm? But it was sort of pretty natural. We always knew it was going to happen. Spent a lot of time on farms growing up and in rural New Zealand is really where my heart is. So it was, um, yeah, it's been, been amazing to, to move on to a farm full time with my family in the last four years. And I guess, yeah, so, so my parents, um, just Justine and Jeff Ross, had a pretty successful career and career in business and after both sort of you know clo closing chapters uh, in their um, business lives decided that they really wanted to give back and after a, I guess you know campaigning on the side for the environment th throughout their lives they were keen to get hands-on and um, you know I've got a lot of respect for them that you know rather than um, you know sort of retiring and sitting at the beach and playing golf they've taken up probably the hardest profession you know there is which is which is farming and, and um, uh, you know pushing really hard every day to make change in a, a sector that really needs it so yeah background in farming uh, and environmentalism and that sort of uh, you know come together in synergy on Lake Howea Station over the last four years uh, and, and there's still a lot underway and we've got uh, pretty ambitions for we were hoping to um to take everything here. So we're at um, Merino and um, Ang Angus Beef Station, but primarily Merino fine wool. We've got around 10,000 stock units, so about 5,000 breeding used, and all their progeny from uh, from this spring. So we've just um, we've just finished tailing. So we've got about th three or four thousand lambs um, that we that will ca carry through um, next winter. And uh, yes, yeah, so a big farming operation and um, a, a, yes, small and growing tourist operation that we've sort of put on hold of over the last year, but really trying to grow that uh, go, going into next year as well, a lot of weddings and events. But yeah, the big thing is what we're doing on the, on the environment. And obviously, you know, we're, we're custodians of a big area of land, 16,000 acres, uh, 7,000 hectares. And as you know, we're obviously privileged to be custodians of a big area of land, but a lot of responsibility comes with that for us, and there's a real opportunity to, to give back. And we're, I guess we're trying to give back by doing something really good for the ecosystem here in Lake Hawea, but also trying to give back as leaders, open sourcing as much of what we're doing as possible, and um, you know, uh, really really trying to innovate with a lot of the technology we're adopting and uh, some some new practices. 
So our, our environmental commitments were split into four things, which I'll just briefly talk to for the next 10 minutes or so, and then hopefully we can have a good good discussion about some of this, this stuff. So firstly, carbon, climate change. Uh, for me, it's the biggest biggest thing there is, uh, you know, um, preeminent issue of our time. And I, I think in every business now, it's got to be the, you know, the number one, number one thing. But obviously, our, uh, our, our climate change response and practices have got to be in synergy with everything else we're doing on the farm so they don't compromise on biodiversity or water quality or on our cultural stuff uh, as well. So carbon, climate change, which, um, which, which, which I'll talk to, and then regenerative agriculture. So uh, we're really, in short, really big advocates for regenerative agriculture and embracing a lot of uh, quite novel farming practices around that, uh, which I'll talk to. Uh, biodiversity, um, ecosystem preservation, we've got a couple of endangered species on, on the station, which we're working really hard to protect. New Zealand's got uh, the, you know, the highest rate of threatened species on the planet, which is pretty pretty shocking. And I think we've got a huge job in New Zealand to do on, do on biodiversity. And we're, we're, we're really trying to lead on that as well. Uh, and, and then water quality as well, which is a you know, huge issue across New Zealand. Luckily for us in our high country setting here with pretty low, low stocking rates, uh, it's, it's, it's not as uh, much of an issue as, as, as in some other parts of New Zealand, but still something we take pretty, pretty seriously. Uh, so yeah, our, 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 our carbon clear brand. So yeah, I guess we're, we're trying to break the mold in that we're going direct to, you know, we've got a big Instagram following, we're doing a lot of marketing, a lot of branding, trying to go direct to our customers, which we are doing in, uh, in Europe and a couple of local Kiwi customers as well with our, um, with our branded carbon clear Merino. Uh, and for anyone who knows much about wool, we, we take that through to tops and then we're able to sell off um, sell off the top straight to customers, and we've been working with New Zealand Merino uh, to help to help set that up, and uh, which is which has been really cool. So we, we uh, when I first got to the farm a couple of years ago, well four, four years ago now, uh, we we first sort of thought you know there's, there's a lot of a uh, lot of sheep here and a lot of cattle here, it must be having a pretty big impact, and so calculated our emissions, which was which was super easy. Uh, you know, it takes five minutes if you've got your nitrogen and your stock numbers and your vehicle hours, vehicle hours, which most farmers have got on hand. And we realized we were emitting about the equivalent of 5,000 tons of CO2 per year, which is a pretty substantial impact on the planet. Uh, and, you know, we wanted to um, not hide that and, you know, to some extent be held accountable uh, for, our, for our carbon emissions. Um, sorry, that was 2,500 tons of, of emissions. Then uh, we worked with a couple of couple of experts, um, Angus McPherson and Debbie Kerr, to calculate our sequestration. I, I I did a little bit of that preliminary. Gets it's much more complicated to calculate sequestration uh, than than emissions. Um, with a bit of climate change and science knowledge, I was able to get you know re really close to what our sequestration was, but we're able to further refine that estimate with Angus and Debbie. Uh, and so the estimate I got was around five thousand tons of sequestration. And uh, so, and so our emissions emissions are two and a half thousand tons, sequestration five thousand tons. Angus and Debbie came along and they said, "Yep, it's around five thousand tons." And then we had it done again by Toitu, uh, in partnership with New Zealand Marina, and they said, "Hey, you're also sequestering." Um, they had it slightly lower, around four thousand six hundred tons, but you're also sequestering, you know, close to five thousand tons per year. So that puts us at two times climate positive. But most of that is um, is incidental. So we've done a huge amount of um, put, putting areas away, uh, you know, re re retiring them, a lot of planting, but most of that is just because it's a huge area of land and there's a lot of, you know, post-1990 vegetation regenerate, regenerating that we're able to qualify. So, and I think there's a bit of complacency in New Zealand, you know, most, well, roughly sheep and beef farms in New Zealand, which are 40% of New Zealand's land mass. So a huge area is uh, sheep and beef farms in New Zealand. That's all roughly uh, um, carbon neutral or about 80, it's offset by about 80%. But that invokes a lot of complacency by farmers saying, hey, we're already carbon neutral. You know, we're, we're good. What, what are we complaining about? But largely carbon neutrality in our view is... Um, is a pretty arbitrary number. So our view is that we want to just have, you know, reduce emissions as much as possible and promote sequestration as much as possible 
uh, within our farming farming system. And so we're really big advocates of just trying to move the, the, the carbon dial as much as possible where it doesn't um, clash with biodiversity and water quality. So we decided we'd set this goal of um, uh, being 10 times carbon, carbon positive. And so then we've got to figure out a bunch of, you know, all, all the possible ways, ways to do that. Uh, and I can yeah, talk to any of these in more detail, particularly the, the seaweed stuff, because that's you know, a bit, bit of work on my PhD with that. But the, the easiest way to, to shift the dial, uh, we've got 5,000 tons of sequestration, 2,500 tons of emissions, is to, is to bring, our, um, bring our emissions down. So, you know, um, because, you know, I guess that's how the multiplier works. If we can cut our emissions by half, our multiplier will, will be four times. So we're looking at uh, re regen ag, you know, there's things like vaccines and um, low emitting stock coming, coming to the market potentially in a couple of years. But the big one for us is this asparagopsis, um, this, this methane reducing seaweed. Uh, which I can which I can talk to in a bit more detail. If anyone's got questions on that at the end, and that that's the that's the thing that we think is possibly going to shift the dial for us for us the most. And we're doing a trial on that hopefully early next year. But at at the moment, um, the this regen ag, um, etc. Et you know, healthier stock are generally low emitting stock. A lot of our practices. There's no good methodology yet to account for that. So no matter what we really do in terms of stock, if we hold the same stock numbers, our methane emissions will still be um, still be the same uh, because there's no methodology that will allow our, our, our change in stock management to, to follow through to our carbon budget. So what we're doing to move the dial at the moment is on the sequestration side. So big, big tree plantings, 15,000 trees, and counting, retiring a lot of land, just letting it go uh, with a lot of supplement pest control uh, and control of some woody weeds. And then we're really hoping to uh, have, you know, methodologies for soil sequestration, tussocks and shelter belts, non-woody vegetation, things like that come through. So we can also account for that within our farming systems. Um, and soil carbon's a big one with our region ag. We're hoping that, um, you know, to some extent, we should be rewarded uh, for our region ag soil carbon buildup as opposed to our neighbour, you know, um, who's doing turnips and grass and loses all that soil carbon every year. Uh, we'd hope that, you know, in the next couple of years, we can, we, we can get, some, get some value for that. So that's climate change really briefly. I can talk to that, um, talk, talk to that for a long time, what we're trying to do, to do on farm. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll get to region ag, which we're super passionate about. Um, you know, it's still relatively controversial in New Zealand and a pretty convoluted debate that we've sort of been involved in a bit. Our, well, well my, my view on region ag is it's, you know, to regenerate life. There's, there's a lot of different, um, I think I heard the other day, there's 364 region ag certification bodies around the world now, although not, not, not a single New Zealand farm, to my knowledge, has yet had a region ag certification methodology. But, you know, that's the big criticism is that there's no one methodology. But I, I still haven't decided if that's a good thing or not, or if it should just be a, you know, general philosophy on farm that is to improve, to improve life, which is really what regeneration is, re improve life of stock, of people, of biodiversity, um, and, and just generally uh, just constantly trying to improve on farm, which we're doing. But obviously there's a couple of specific principles that come with Regen Ag. One being diverse pastures. So we're uh, actually, we're just sowing, sowing all our Regen um, crops at the moment, all our winter crops. This, this uh, sorry, for next year will be, win, uh, will be Regen multi-species crops for the first time. Um, we are sowing both perennial and annual crops at the moment up to 30 species, 30 species mixed. And what's been, what's difficult for us on a really big property is to adopt that Alan Savory holistic grazing model where you've got a big mob and a, you know, really tight area and they're moving through quite quickly. So we're working on ways to do that. But for now it's been really about, you know, low inputs, diverse pastures um, with, with the region ag. And we, you know, we, we have soil tests that we monitor and follow up with, with everything. Um, as as well so you know no no tillage we're trying to reduce sprays as much as 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 possible um and yeah it's been 
a lot of people say, well, isn't it, you know, what, uh, is there a compromise on, uh, is there a compromise on uh, yield or is it, you know, more, co more costly? And I think this is a, this is a re the, probably one of the biggest, you know, solutions that we can make overnight for me in uh, agriculture in New Zealand, you know, winter grazing, super controversial, but for us, we trialed, you know, um, fodder beet, turnips and grass, traditional winter crops that are applied everywhere across the New Zealand against our 25, 30 species uh, winter crops this year. And we were getting, you know, typically we get about 20, 20 tonne a hectare. Um, don't, don't want to get into too much specifics, but for those farmers on the call, we were getting about 20, 21 hectares off our turnips and grass, grass mix. And this year we got about 23 tonne a hectare off our... Um, off our multi-species region mix, which was, so not only are we getting more yield off it, but it was actually a lot lower tractor hours. So about a third of the tractor hours to, uh, to, with our region winter crops. And we're also, you know, these, these paddocks of teeming with birds and butterflies. Uh, the stock pressed up against, you know, you see them pressed up against a break fence on traditional winter crops and they're just mowing their heads off. And the, we're, we're surrounded by a lot of, lot of winter grazing here. And you can see, you know, in our neighbor's paddocks, the cows are, you know, really runny poos, sometimes up to their knees in mud after a big rain, mowing their heads off. And our cows are sort of on this, you know, nice bed of, um, of, 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 of region. There's no pugging. All the poos really, really solid and they're not mowing at all. They're, most of them are sitting as, a, as opposed to standing sort of. Um, and just so, yeah, generally welfare better. We're building up soil carbon. And so I'm, yeah, yet to see many metrics where our winter grazing uh, fall, sh fall short to traditional winter grazing, um, you know, and economics wise, it just, it stacks up much better. Then, yeah, then biodiversity, which is a conversation that's perhaps been drowned out a little bit by water quality in the last five years in New Zealand. Um, you know, we've got the highest rate of threatened species in the world, which is something I think not, not a lot of people know. We've lost over 50% of New Zealand's, of New Zealand's birds have gone extinct. So we've got a lot of work to do on biodiversity. And without wanting to talk too much about what we're doing here, uh, we've, we've sort of got five critically endangered species. So that's three of them there. These are the these are the other two. But the big one is the grand grand skink for us. So um, we've got the last population of the western form of the grand skink left in the wild in, in the world. So um, it's sort of something we we can't even wrap our heads around that. You know, we're custodians of of the last 30 or so of these skinks, which is pretty phenomenal. So we have got, um, yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of trapping and monitoring for the skinks to try and protect, protect that last population from going extinct uh, pretty much, which is, you know, a pr pretty big responsibility. Uh, got a good stronghold of native falcons here, the Clutha flathead galaxid as well, which is the second most endangered fish in New Zealand. Got a small remnant population of them. Um, and yeah, the other big one is the cypress hebe. Of this, and there's only a couple, there's only sort of three decent stands left in the wild and two of them are on Lake Kauai Station. So a lot of work to be done protecting them. And then generally all the other, uh, all, all the other native and endemic species on LHS uh, we're, we're working to protect as, as well with pest control and uh, a, lot of, a lot of planting and um, restoration fencing areas off. We've had our environmental plan done by uh, Professor David David Norton, and um, you know, largely a lot of our what I've just talked about is sort of run by our uh, by our farm environment plan, which is I think something a lot of farmers in New Zealand are, are, are starting to adopt. And yeah, we uh, we yeah, take that take that really really seriously and um, have a annual review process on that, which is I think a really good way to hold us accountable um, to our environmental performance um that's sort of a summary of that's a pretty pretty beefy document water uh, so we've, we're lucky to be on the uh, foreshore of lake Harwe here we've got seven kilometers of lakefront which uh, doesn't uh, which is all fenced with a 35 meter buffer and i don't know if any of you have spent time in lake Harwe, but we're hoping to plant the 7k of on our lake with another 6k um down from Timaru Creek, right around Lake Kawe, all the way to the Hawe Pub, uh, which we're which we're really excited about. Uh, that's a huge bit of work, huge bit of work though. But yeah, generally trying to plant, uh, uh, sorry, fence off all our creeks and plant in them as well. Uh, we're part of the local catchment group, 
and um, have a um, a biannual monitoring um, exercise on all our waterways as 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 well. There's this um, we did we did pre COVID we had the American student group coming to the farm every year to to do that, uh, but obviously they haven't been able to get here. Uh, they, they've got this really cool. Um, uh, I'd, I'd love to share more details on it. Actually, it's this. Um, uh, the, the names just slip me, but it's this methodology for really simple sort of takes half an hour to an hour, um, walk a section of stream and don't need you know much equipment at, at all uh, or virtually no equipment that um, they've developed out of Cawthorn, which is a really simple way for farmer, farmers to monitor the health of their streams um, year on year out, which we've, which we've adopted. Then technology is another big one for us. So we've got, um, yeah, we're on Farm IQ, we're doing um, EID um, and yeah, drones um, What uh, and iris is another big one. So a lot of people find this one quite funny that we're doing face ID for our sheep. So all our sheep have um, had photos of their face taken and are, and are recognized through that, which makes it a lot quicker in the yards. And, you know, we can build a bit of data around our stock as well, which is, which is really cool. The sea forest trial I mentioned before is, is they're the asparagopsis company. So we're trying, you know, we're, we're going to work with them next year to get this um, asparagopsis uh, seaweed out to our stock to cut methane. Uh, we also work with agri, ag, agri sea products, uh, our drenches and a bit of fertilizer as, as well. And then, yeah, uh, GIS um, mapping um, and yeah, has, has some really good data sets there for our vegetation as, as well. Uh, and then, yeah, animal welfare is something we take really seriously. Um, you can have a quick read of bullet points there. I'll just quickly give give one example of something we've done a bit different on animal welfare. And that is, I, I think, we, we think it was the first time it had been used in New Zealand, but our share is this year, rather than being paid uh, for how many sheep they put through, uh, put through each day, they get paid, uh, they get an animal health or animal welfare scorecard. Uh, so, um, uh, one of one of our one of our stock managers is there, and um, and and his job is to is to mark the shares on animal welfare as well as a few other things, and so they'll get paid uh, on on the animal welfare scorecard. And so we, I think we we lost about well, we were slower by about fifteen, uh, ten to fifteen percent. So, but you know that only added an extra half a day on for our sharing this year, and that was a, a compromise we we're pretty happy to make for much happier happier sheep and also the share is actually much preferred as 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 well this year which was which was really cool much prefer that to being sort of under the pump and constantly having to go 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 uh, all, all day that they could you know um, to some extent just take a, a, a little bit more time and be a bit more careful with the animals um, pest control is, is another um, obviously huge part of what we do here uh, we work with high country contracting to do uh, a lot of mostly possums and ferrets, but also cats, um, cats as well. And yeah, working on community engagement um, stuff as well. So a lot of school visits and we host a lot of farming groups here as, as well. And yeah, generally trying to um, support the local community as much as possible and have open days and, you know, generally trying to not shut this you know, big area of New Zealand off to, to, to the public. Um, where we have you know responsible people accessing through the property, pretty open to you know collaborating with different uh, different different local groups. Actually, uh, the other uh, really cool collaboration we've um, just announced is with the local forest and bird branch. They're offsetting. Uh, we, we've put aside a small area of land for them to do all their planting in, which will offset the carbon emissions from the Central Otago um, forest and bird branch. So that's a really cool collaboration. There's a bit of a summary slide of everything um, there, which I can probably finish on. Um, and then, yeah, going forward, the big one is moving our, our carbon dial. Uh, we're trying to really innovate on a lot of the region ag stuff and open source source that, uh, trying to host a lot of scientists here and stuff. And I guess we're yeah, happy to innovate and make mistakes on there so we can share that information with other farmers. Um, Beach, beach forest habitat restoration is something I'm really passionate about. I think a lot of people forget that the Southern Lakes, Queenstown, Monica, 
only a few hundred years ago, it was all just massive beach and toucher forest. And it's pretty easy to forget that that's, um, you know, literally all been burnt. So we're trying to um, bring back large scale beach forest, which obviously is going to take a long, long time, but uh, that's a big goal of ours. Trying to go all off grid on the farm. Um, and then, yeah, generally trying to accelerate a lot of, a lot of the stuff I, I talked to earlier. Um, so yeah, I've sort of done a really quick go over of everything, but I uh, hope, hope that gave a bit of insight into what we're doing on, on the farm. Um, pro probably last thing to mention is, and I'm not sure if it was in one of those slides, is our relationship with our customers overseas. So one of our customers is called Sheep Inc. They're a um, London-based company that sell 10 times carbon positive sweaters, and we're selling, selling direct to them. Um, They've actually, I've got it, got it here. Let me show you, show you this. So this is a sheep ink sweater uh, from from the UK, but from wool on the station, and it's got a little uh, QR code on it. So if you buy, if you're in the UK and you buy one of these sweaters or anywhere around the world, you can scan the QR code on your farm, and it will take you back to um, Lake Howea Station or or one of the other two stations that supply sheep ink. Uh, and you'll be able to name a sheep on the farm, which is a really cool way of that, you know, ultra traceability with, with consumers. Um, and, and we, our farm IQ is linked to them so that when we move our stock, you'll name a sheep in that mob. Uh, we, we can't name, you know, the exact sweater back to the sheep, but we can get it back to the mob and you'll be able to see when your sheep moves around and, you know, know exactly what paddock it is halfway around the world, which is, which is really cool. And, uh, you know, really hoping to be transparent with our customers and uh, really, really happy to be part of some of those initiatives. We're also uh, supplying Maggie Marilyn, Allbirds, and a few others we've signed NDAs with. But um, uh, another tomorrow is another a New York company we, we um, have partnered with. But yeah, generally a lot of these brands are really excited about being contacted directly. That's something my, my mum and dad are really passionate about is that marketing relationship. Um, and that's been, yeah, really, really good for the, for the station to be able to um, have, have that direct relationship. Uh, and, and, you know, we're getting um, significant premiums off doing that as, as, as well. And um, yeah, hoping to uh, sort of facilitate those sorts of relationships for other farmers as, as, as well. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's, that's everything. Um, how's, how's that, Peter? Anything I've, yeah, anything I've no, missed? That's great. Um, look, I've got a, one question here so far and there's other topics we can pick up on. Do you want, do you want to stop sharing now and we can? Yeah, cool. um, Yeah. Um, did you consider biochar as part of your carbon clear pathway that comes from Trevor Richards? We've actually just can just been considering it. So we're 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 super keen to 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 trial some biochar, you know, spreading um spreading some on our region paddocks. We've um we've got we've got a lot of, you know, we do a lot of mulching, uh, a lot of our on our, a lot of our woody weeds. So trying to put that into biochar. So we're trying to sort of working out how we can build something at a large scale on the on the farm. Um, but that's something we're pretty pretty open to learning a lot on as well. But we've just actually just employed a new guy in the last three weeks, Tyler, who's uh, going to sort of take the lead on a lot of our um, biodiversity. He's an agronomist as well, and he's going to um, yeah be, be be running our biochar yeah. next year, hopefully. Hey, and um, uh, it's very impressive, I must say, uh, and it's really good to hear that there's probably other farms coming into the ecosystem too. Is that how it's going to work? For sure, yeah. Um, so we yeah, we're trying to open source everything as much as possible. We're even looking at a way to potentially open source our accounts next year. Um, and yeah, we get messages from farmers all the time, a lot on you know Instagram on our website asking, hey, how did you do your carbon budget? Is the you know question we get a, a million times. Um, and so yeah, we're we're yeah, really trying to help farmers as much as possible calculate their emissions and sequestration, get there. To get to get their number, um, and a lot a lot of farmers, um, a lot of interest in the region side of things as well, and we're yeah pointing them to what seed mix we've used and um, a lot of our learnings off our our, our region. Yeah. yeah, well, you you did talk there about the food pharmacy for your sheep, and I, I recall looking at um looking at an analysis of what's in plantain, and there's just so much um, in that one plant. It would be yeah. really interesting you know, with that with that seed mix to see what the what all the camp, uh, the compounds are. Yeah, um, this, 
this question comes through from Rolf too uh, about how you apply the seaweed because I, you know, I think they probably need a daily dose, I guess. And if you, you know, if you've got a big, big, um, big mobs, how, how's that going to work? Yeah, good question. So I, I sort of glossed over that. So for those who who missed that, I gen yeah generally don't believe um, that there's any silver bullet for climate change in agriculture in New Zealand. But if I had to yeah. pick one. Reluctantly, it would be asparagopsis. I think it's potentially super exciting. And so that's a, a type of red seaweed we have in uh, New Zealand. It's mostly on Stewart Island in Tasmania. Uh, there's two companies who are actively growing it and hoping to bring it bring to market at some point next year. But it's a it's a seaweed which, when fed to stock, can cut methane uh, by about you know potentially up to 98, percent which is which is pretty mm. phenomenal. And so you need um, the stock need a 0.5% of their daily feed to come from the seaweed. So that's a really good question is, and, you know, it works really well in, um, in dairy farms, which is where it's mostly been trialed where they can, or, or in, um, or in feedlot systems. Uh, but on the farm, yeah, how do we get the seaweed to our stock every day? Potentially, we don't actually know how much they're going to like it. So if we can get it out to them and they just sort of love eating it, then that'll be the easiest way. But you know, potentially we can mix it into our um, mix it into our silage or some of our uh, winter feed. But also potentially uh, looking to get it in things like salt licks or hopefully our water troughs would be um, awesome as a or you can get an oil isolate from it and put that in our water troughs, which would be great. Mm, okay. Um, but you know, potentially I think for New Zealand, you know, fifty percent of our emissions come from methane from from livestock. And if we can cut that by 98%, I think we should be really, you know, investing a lot in that in that research for sure. Hey, look, I'll just uh, quickly share my screen because we talked about this earlier. Um, what I have here, and these figures don't don't quite stack up with what yours how yours stack up, but they are. Um, I took them from a stuff article. Um, so it shows the methane emissions and the and the CO two emissions, and, and that that. That total there was similar to what you mentioned, the two and a half thousand tons. And then on the other hand, you've got the um, you've got your tree planting and regenerating bush sink. Mm -hmm. um, but as yet, there's no no figure for soil carbon sequestration. That remains sort of a problematic, I guess, doesn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, at, at the moment, so the only the only thing we've got to qualify is each or is, is um, post 1990 forest that meets most of the ETS description. Uh, so that's, you know, all just our woody, uh, you know, our, our woody regenerating, regenerating bush. And then tree plantings are, are actually quite a small proportion of that, even though we've planted 15,000 trees, their sequestration is pretty small at the moment. So yeah, soil carbon and tussock. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of Things that are sucking in carbon on the farm that aren't yet, you know, we don't really have good methodologies yet for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we also talked about the fact that, um, you know, methane, it's pretty one sided because you're only looking at methane emissions, but there's methane sinks too. And, you know, I mentioned that 90% of your, your um, methane is, is uh, degraded by, by hydroxyl and hydroxyl's. You know, developed out of created out of water vapor in the presence of ultraviolet light. So you got to have it there. I mean, that's and, and it's just a matter of quantifying that. Yeah, no, it's it's something I I don't know a lot about. Um, but it's it's absolutely another number that's that's quite clearly missing from there. And yeah. um, yeah. So so this is our these are our toy two toy two numbers which are in that staff article. So yeah, two and a half thousand tons of emissions, and then just under 4,000 tons of sequestration. But so it, it would have been 5,000, but Toy 2 withhold 20% as a condition of, um, as, as sort of a, um, a, a to, to me, it's sort of a somewhat random condition of being over conservative because we're already quite over conservative with our 5,000 tons in practice, but they just sort of withhold 20% as a, as, as a yeah. buffer. Now, the other, the other figure down the bottom there, direct temperature reduction, um, you know, because plants transpire, they um, there's a heat flux created, and they they naturally cool the environment. You know, so if, if you had a city there by the side of the lake, it would be a lot hotter. Um, you know, with bare surfaces. So that that's that again is something that even if methane's a bit of a stretch, that's even more of a stretch at the moment. 
but to me it just sort of really shows the potential that that uh, that you've got there huh absolutely yeah i think it's something that's really important to consider while um while you know greenhouse gas concentrations are the best proxy for the world's temperature you know ultimately what we're looking at is uh the you know the planet's temperature and there's other things that influence that beyond just that we can you know Im Im influence with management changes than just um co co2 and, and methane um and yeah uh localized cooling is definitely one of those you know if you're on uh bare soil you know december there's still a lot of winter crops that are exposed down here they yeah. you know they're, that's, they're, that's really hot on on the ground as opposed to our region which hold moisture a lot longer I was, I was um, saying before, you know, just yesterday we were out and there's, we've just had a big bit of rain yesterday and all our, you know, there's still a little bit of bare soil uh, where we had winter crops and all that's now just bone dry and, you know, heats up quite a bit. But where we've got, you know, that region crop coming through, what's been planted, we sort of have year round some sort of cover on the soil. It's never exposed. There's definitely that localised cooling effect as well. The, then the other one, again, is, um, is albedo, which is another quite, a, a bit more complex conversation but that's definitely an impact um that we yeah. that we have on on um localized yeah um temperature so i mean the an important an important task then is also getting leverage with us with policy makers um have you got any plans for that well we've had um we've had uh damien o'connor here and yeah full disclosure i'm on the um labor policy committee for the environment um and yeah we'll probably be here all night if i um was to give all my thoughts on <laughs> agricultural policy in new zealand but yeah i guess i mean to some extent we're not trying to be political on um like how we're yeah. stationed now we're just trying to do best practice and just open source every everything we do uh and really just trying to bring um you know have some really robust debates but bring as many people on board uh with us as possible the one policy thing I think, um, you know, that we're thinking about a lot on Lake Harwear Station is because we're a really early adopter of a lot of this climate change, climate change stuff. Uh, that this Hewaka Ekenoa proposal. So um, that's the uh, the organisation that the go that the um, it's a primary industry partnership that the government has set up to consult on uh, potential policy for a pricing framework for greenhouse gas agricultural greenhouse gas emissions in New Zealand and they've just released some of their, their draft proposals and there's yeah I don't want to get into details but there's two options there but for me that's going to be the next year that's going to be the biggest policy that affects farmers in New Zealand that's decided on and I think that's a, a conversation that New Zealand farmers really need to be across because um, yeah it's going to be absolutely the biggest thing for farmers next year in terms of in terms of policy. Yeah, well, those two options. Eh? One is um, farm level measures, and the other one's processor level measures. And if yeah. they go with processor level measures, it's got it just cuts out any any potential for innovation um, at the farm level, you know. And that it would seem to me that the farm level measures are, are, are what's got to have to happen. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's, it's a really interesting one. Um, I guess because you know, in the next sort of two or three years. We're not going to have we don't we're still not going to have methodologies that are going to be able to show that as a result of a management change our our um, stock yeah. emission methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions have come down, but um, there will be other things that will you know we will be able to show that will will come down. So, but at, at, at some stage, you know, a bunch of farms are going to start adopting asparagopsis or methane vaccines, and that needs to be able to reflect that those farms need to be able to be rewarded for that. Uh, and you know, if if a processor level uh level levy compromises that and that's definitely a problem yeah um just getting back to the temperature uh, just for a little bit i, I got a I bought, I bought a little seek infrared um imaging device for my for my cell phone and it's it works really easily and you know it shows a temperature differential say i haven't been outside yet because it's been raining you know but um it shows a temperature differential on a cup of coffee of about, I don't know, I think I had it in Fahrenheit for a start, it was a massive range. And it would be mm. really interesting to look at a, look down a fence line at a paddock with um, a diverse pasture and maybe a paddock that's a little bearer. And, and you've, got a, you've, got a, you've got an image that can't lie with a, scale, with a temperature scale to the side of it. I would be super excited to, to see that. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I think, and I think that's the other 
thing that is a is the win 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 is that soil soil carbon and soil water and local localized temperature are all completely coupled so you know the more carbon we put in the soil the more water we're going to you know get in the soil as well higher drought resistance and also will um with all that transpiration happening will bring down temperatures locally which is uh what you know it's not going to bring down temperatures in winter but it's going to bring down temperatures when it gets really hot in summer which is important yeah have you, have you given thought to the the biotic pump and how that applies where you are because i mean i think conventionally we'd be thinking that you're in a rain shadow with the alps but um you know if, if there are forests if there are coastal forests they are meant to bring the rain further inland aren't they yeah exactly um and i'm, I'm sure that is absolutely happening ha happening here i'm not sure if as a result of all the deep, it's, it's a really good question actually, as a result of you know massive deforestation on the east coast of the South Island. Yeah. I recently yeah. drive, I've done many times Christchurch to Hawea. I did it a couple of weeks ago and decided I'm having to count the native trees today. And I got four hours without seeing a single native tree, um, yeah. which I thought, you know, that, um, we, we've got this just so wrong. Um, our, our, our farming systems in New Zealand that I could go four hours without seeing a single native. Um, and I, I would, yeah, I, I would assume that to some extent that's been exacerbated, but you know, that uh, we, we've had a yeah. lot lower rainfall to the far east as a result of that. The rainfall shadow is absolutely phenomenal here. Mm. You know, just at, between one end of the farm and the other, the vegetation is different because we get um, much higher rainfall there. And then, you know, m much less at the other end. It's, um, yeah, it's a pretty amazing comparison. You know, 60 kilometers to the west is, one of the wettest places in the world of Haast and then 60 kilometers to um, the east is Alexandra, which is the driest area in New Zealand and, you know, uh, virtually a desert in some, some places. So uh, yeah, you, and you, you often, you know, you see it coming down the lake and it, you're right. It actually stops on the beach forest sometimes um, mm -hmm. and, and doesn't come down the lake to us. So we're, we're you know, we're definitely rainfall uh, rain limited here. Is fire an issue for you? It hasn't been, but I think it will. It will be, uh, and it's so yeah. we've actually we've put in a couple of ponds and um, a new fire system. It's something we're super aware of, and yeah, keen to explore how our management changes, um, you know, could could interact with our you know our, our fire risk. You you will be you'd probably be aware of those larger scale permaculture initiatives that tend to slow down water by by having the various structures that sort of gather the water but allow yes, through yeah. too and that yep, rehydrates yep. the um rehydrates the landscape and probably makes mm. you a bit more fire resistant is that um in your thinking yeah i, I to be honest i haven't given it much thought at all um i'm just trying to I've, I've actually been thinking it through this afternoon since you raised it earlier today um on you know what impact our region pastures if we've got these you know quite high region pastures what impact they're going to have as opposed to our, you know, whatever it was before, traditional ryegrass, clover mix. Um, yeah, it's something I'd have to give a little bit more thought to. Okay. Mm. Yeah, look, and, and a couple more questions here have come in. Um, uh, are you aware, engaged with in, INDUFOR, that's I-N-D-U-F-O-R, drone-supported recognition of sequestration in cooperation with Zion? That's from Rolf. No, I'm, no, I'm not aware... Um, we're working with uh, Car Carbon Crop, who have a um, s satellite imagery and artificial intelligence that goes over that satellite imagery that calculates sequestration, and yeah. have also worked with Land Pro. They've done um, uh, some 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 fixed wing flyovers that get our chlorophyll measures and those sort of things. But no, I haven't looked at the drone one. I'd be really keen to to check that out. Yeah, well, the the chlorophyll has to be a pretty close um, analog for carbon, doesn't it? You'd think it'd be as close as there is, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Mm. And and uh, have you tracked that over time, or was it, was that a one-time sort of? No, we've, we've only had it had it done once. Yeah. Um. So if we, you know, it's but it's a pretty expensive exercise. So okay. Did it again in five years. Um. But I, I actually heard the other day. Um. I, yeah. There's a lot of awesome remote sensing tech to calculate sequestration coming through. Definitely keen to check out the drone one. Is there's a uh, actually a Wanaka couple who are tapping into Air New Zealand planes now and every time an Air New Zealand plane flies now they've got these little cameras underneath that calculate 
have some proxy for sequestration. They're trying to build up a national database, um, or maybe it's for better. Maybe it's just better imagery for sequestration potentially. Okay. Yeah. Hey, look, there's another question here from Paul Mudge. Is there any breeding for low uh, methane emission merinos? I know there is for strong wool sheep with promising results. Yeah, well, actually, one of my friends is uh, doing a PhD at Lincoln is, um, has, has been involved in those low methane uh, strong wool sheep. I, th I think there have been a couple. Um, don't quote me on that though but it's yeah it's definitely as not as progressed as as strong as, as strong wool but i mean we were talking about it at the um at the ram sales at the start of the year how awesome would it be when you know um when every ram comes through and they've got their scorecard that they've also got a methane um a methane measure there i think that would be super super exciting okay and another question here uh from rosie you guys are amazing how, how have you been accounting for your emissions for your niche things you do on the farm, e.g. region pasture mixes and using natural drenches compared to standard ones? Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's only so much that has the myth that, you know, has a standardized, you know, decent methodology that we can, we can use. So drenches, we haven't, we haven't got one for. Fertilizer um, is obviously the big one, which we've cut out completely now, um, artificial fertilizers. Mm. Uh, yeah, so sequestration from our region, uh, we, we don't. There's no methodologies yet for. Um, it's, we're just doing that because it's best best practice, and but generally, really hoping to see more methodologies come through, as possible. Uh, yeah, f f fuel is is the other big one that we've accounted for. Waste, all that stuff that can currently be picked up by the you know standardised farm emission calculators across New Zealand, and I've got a. a a bit of a list of a link of those that I can send through to anyone who's interested in the calculators. Um, but yeah, if there's a methodology, we've done it. If not, um, we, we haven't. Okay. Um, and a little more on animal health too, Finn. I, I'm just wondering what, you know, have you, a lot of the farmers who I've been in touch with report that over time their, their vet bills go down quite dramatically and their um, animal health remedies expenditure goes down significantly too what what have you observed there and an analogy my dad often uses is, is uh you, you know what when you wake up in the morning if you want an orange juice or a bacon sandwich or a banana smoothie that's your body sort of telling you hey i need you know i need this it's that those are the nutrients I, I need um but if you woke up every morning and you just had a uh bowl you know bowl of wheat bix with um that was half full of brown sugar, which is pretty much what ryegrass is now. It's, you know, it's so high in sugar and yeah, just yeah. so, yeah, it's just jacked full of, you know, grow, 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 grow. Um, that, yeah, obviously that's not going to be super good for you if you have that every every morning. And, you know, sheep are, are definitely able to self, self-medicate. self There's really strong evidence for that as well. And if they've got ryegrass and clover every morning, they're not really able to do that as opposed to if they've got 30 species. And, you know, if, I guess... There's an argument that obviously a ruminant gut works a lot differently, but I think um, some of the early research that we've seen is that diverse pastures generally have promoted, um, uh, yeah, not only high growth rates, but much better animal health across the board. There was a, don't want to go on for too long here, but there was a study at Lincoln done and they had, um, they had six groups, so four traditional pastures and they had um, pregnant lambs, uh, pr pregnant ewes with, with twins on four traditional pastures you know ryegrass clover uh whatever the other two were the fifth one was a blend of all four pastures so they literally put them all in a blender and made the the ewes eat those and the sixth one was all four but the stock were able to choose between the four and it might might have been more than four but you know on the, the four traditional crops the um the lambing percentage and growth rates were about exactly the same the fifth mm. one where it was a forced blend of all four four or five uh the growth rates and lambing percentage were slightly higher but the sixth one outperformed all the others by a long way where the sheep were actually able to go in and choose which one they which one they wanted um yeah so yeah i think there's there's, yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff we're doing um num, num nuts and so with our tailing uh we're, we're trying to give a little bit of um localized anesthetic things like that that we're doing but i think healthier healthier stock on our region pastures is absolutely what we're what we're seeing and that's uh, you know, f following through to um, uh, the, the bank balance as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah.
Um, yeah, any other questions to come through? We'll just give that a minute or two. And while we're, while we're waiting for a question, I'm just going to get that uh, camera device. Yeah, cool. Super keen to see that. It'd be amazing to see it down a split down a fence line. It's tiny. Um, this one was about 500 all up. I, I chose a sort of a mid range model. So that's it there. Oh, cool. Wow, that is really small. Yeah, it's it's um, uh, USB C. It just goes into mm -hmm. my Android phone. And uh, yeah, really simple to use. Yeah, so uh, you know, um, I did I did a bit of work a few years ago looking at soil sequestration, and I I, I called the paper a uh, contested space in science because there were so many people there saying, well, we're already, you know, our, our soils are carbon rich already, and there's not nothing much we can do, and you know, and you put more carbon in, it's like they had this sink model. Where the more you put in, the more goes out the end, and so you know it's, there's, a, there's a net balance. So the science was really confused, and it still yeah. remains pretty unsettled, doesn't it? It does. It's um yeah. There's a yeah. Some people say, well, our soil is already super saturated with carbon, which it can get, but I think that's pretty few places in in New Zealand. Um, but it's super localized. You know, that's I think that's why it's so difficult, been difficult to get a soil carbon methodology because. We have different soil carbon concentrations within a paddock, let alone within a farm, let alone within a, within a country. Um, so to get a standardized way of measuring and reporting that that's not super, super costly is, um, is, is, has been the challenge. It seems that in New Zealand, if you look at the two, um, uh, if you look at the dairy industry and the, and the dry stock industry, that beef and lamb seem to be relatively open to innovation and change. Um, compared to the dairy industry. Um, and so I think that's where possibly the, the greatest inflection point is for change, eh? Um, and I'm just, just wondering that if, uh, 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 we can probably assume that most dry stock farms would, would be getting close to zero anyway. Um, especially you know, where we are up here, for example, is a fair bit of native bush Usually there's margins and the whole course is a whole lot more planting going on. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, it might be typically dairy farmers have a bit more debt than um, sheep and beef farmers, which might sort yeah. of slow yeah. their, you know, willingness to to innovate and, and, and take risks. Um, yeah, I think, I, I guess it's, you know, dairy farming is, you know, I, I guess to some extent a bit more, there's sort of one mould for it. Um, in, yeah. in New Zealand and yeah it's it's a pretty it's a pretty tough one to be able to take risks when you're really competing you know and trying to farm to a commodity to farm to a commodity price um, not a lot of wiggle room in some instances uh, so yeah p potentially innovation needs to be more policy led in the dairy sector so do you see you know signs of hope in terms of the the wider industry like through beef and lamb for example to, to some to some extent, I think there's a lot of farmers doing really cool cool stuff now. But there's also, I mean, to be frank, there's also a hell of a lot that aren't. Um, yeah. And yeah, generally nothing's happening, you know, ne nearly quick enough. Um, yeah, a lot of species in New Zealand are you know still in decline, and meth you know methane emissions have mostly stabilised a, a little bit because practices have improved, but mostly because stock numbers have sort of stabilised and not increasing rapidly in New Zealand. So there's still a, a long, long way to go. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've seen you on country calendar yet. Is that... Um... Yeah, good question. We've actually, we've been asked uh, a heap of times, but we sort of want to have a few runs on the board before we do that first. Um, and there's still a couple of things. But having said that, I think we've given in and we, we might be doing filming in April, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Another question here from Trevor Richards. Uh, is there a wilding problem at Awea? Luckily, luckily, no. Um, yeah. Very luckily, yes. Yeah. So we're super, super careful that we don't want there to be. There's a couple of, we've got a couple of woodlots and things, but um, very luckily, you know, Arthur's Pass and the Mackenzie country, Southland, we don't have the wilding uh, pine problems that they do there. So will you be deliberately um, regenerating the, the beach forests? Is that 
the plan? That's the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you need a beach is you know really really difficult to regenerate because you need that symbiotic mycorrhiza in the soil, and generally it's hard to plant them out by themselves. You know they. It's been a pretty amazing evolutionary story actually with beech forests that uh, we definitely don't have time to, but because their seeds, you know, literally drop straight, straight down, they don't have any method for seed dispersal. They can only go out at a meter a year. And generally that, you know, for those seeds to incubate, they need to be within that really rich humus of um, a beech forest floor. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Hey, and uh, another question here from Rosie. What's your top tip for farmers for getting ahead with their environmental practices? but don't know where to start. I think the first one is um, calculating your carbon number, just going in and putting the numbers in. It's actually super easy to do to calculate your emissions. So I think, yeah, uh, it's, it's a difficult one for some people who aren't, don't know too much carbon about carbon to get their heads around. But the first thing is just separating your emissions and sequestration are completely different numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and calculating your emissions is the, is the first thing you can do. And you've got, every farmer's got all the numbers they need to calculate their emissions just like that. Uh, and that's absolutely the first place I would start. And then I think it's just about reading, you know, reading as much as possible from as many different sources. And then hopefully, uh, you know, when um, some of your pastures come to the end of their, end of their tenure, uh, you know, look at look at drilling in a few different seed mixes. I think is the best way, and uh, just having a couple of, I guess, play play paddocks on the region side is is the best way to start. And that's how we know some people have just sort of started and they've gone, you know, put in to put in three new paddocks, drilled three times, and you know, one or two of them haven't worked, and one's gone absolutely gangbusters, and their stock look like they love it, and it's you know it's completely new, but it's really excited them, and then they'll, you know, go from one to five hectares and a little bit more, and then and then go from there. And do you find that some seeds sort of tend to sit there for a while and maybe, you know, you think it's a failure, but they come up um, in their own exactly. time? Yeah, it's quite, it's quite funny. You'll go down and go, I thought, we'd, I thought this was a region, you know, now when some of them have only just, just started to come away because they've only, only been drilled a couple of weeks ago, like I thought it was a region, not a, you know, not clover. And the clover's had an initial, an initial little flush. Um, and then the beach will come through or something. They'll all come through at different times. There will be three or four, and then all of a sudden, it's just this big floral bouquet that's just pumping with bees and birds. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, pretty pretty beautiful come sort of March. Yeah, yeah. Hey, well, thank you very much. It's um, truly inspiring. You know, um, it's really good that you're doing this. And, yeah, thanks to all those who have who've, um, who've dropped in to listen too. This is being recorded, so I will send that out. We had about 44 people, um, 44 people registered, but we got about 15 or 16 participants. So, um, yeah, we need to get stories like this out, Finn. For sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, follow. follow if, I'm not sure if you've got Instagram, Peter, but um, everyone else follow Lake Coe Station on Instagram. Um, okay, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. One more question, just about your, your PhD. Can you quickly sort of, I know it's hard, it's a challenge to quickly explain, explain it, but uh, have a go. So yeah, seaweed is a nature-based solution to climate change. And I've got to get good at giving a quick summary of my PhD. So in short, what I'd really like to do is grow a heap of seaweed out in the ocean and sink it to the bottom as a carbon sink. So instead of yeah. doing what we're doing on land with pines, growing them all for our carbon, we'll do it instead with seaweed offshore. Um, We've got a long, long way to go, but that's the goal. Yeah, because it's um, well, a lot of the ocean is effectively desert, isn't it? And in, in, in it's a it's a new frontier, really. Yeah, I think um, yeah. seaweed aquaculture well, is absolutely a new frontier. Yeah, not to be exploited, but um, you know, but to to really populate and For to sure. probably probably um, supplant industrial fishing totally. Absolutely. Eventually. Yeah. Yep. Oh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, we'll keep in touch. Eh? And I'll, I'll send you some details about this because I'd awesome. love to see some photos. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Peter. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Yeah, thank you. Bye.